The basis for our sermon this morning is taken from the book of Romans, chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, in 1863, the Civil War had been raging for two years, and in an act of trust in the Almighty, some within the United States Senate decided to go to President Abraham Lincoln and ask him for a day of national repentance and mourning of fasting and prayer. This isn't to say that everybody back in those days trusted in Jesus as their savior by any means. And yet they realized, some of them, that the solution to the problem that was facing the nation as the Civil War raged on was that each and every citizen of the country, both in the North and the South, should call upon God and confess their own individual sins. Because the North and the South were divided, states were fighting in states, but sometimes the battle lines were drawn right down the middle of families themselves. And instead of calling out one side or another, instead of calling out one group or individual or another, these are the words of President Abraham Lincoln as he recognizes something that not too many people want to recognize today. In March of 1863, this proclamation was put out by the President of the United States of America. Whereas the Senate of the United States, devoutly recognizing the supreme authority and just government of Almighty God, in all the affairs of men and of nations, has by a resolution requested the President to designate and set apart a day for national prayer and humiliation. And whereas it is the duty of nations, as well as of men, to own their dependence upon the overruling power of God, to confess their sins and transgressions in humble sorrow, yet with assured hope that genuine repentance will lead to mercy and pardon, and to recognize the sublime truth announced in the Holy Scriptures and proven by all history, that those nations only are blessed whose God is the Lord. And in so much as we know that, by his divine law, Nations, like individuals, are subjected to punishments and chastisements in this world. May we not justly fear that the awful calamity of civil war, which now desolates the land, may be but a punishment inflicted upon us for our presumptuous sins to the needful end of our national reformation as a whole people? We have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven, we have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and, enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to the God that made us. It behooves us, then, to humble ourselves before the offended power, to confess our national sins, and to pray for clemency and forgiveness. Yes, he was willing to admit something that many in his day didn't want to admit, but also many in our present day do not want to admit. We all are deserving of punishment and chastisement. And that sometimes in order to make us open our eyes and pay attention, sometimes in order for our good, God does, does bring his anger on individuals and on nations and on groups of people. Paul himself, in our, God, in our lesson for today from the book of Romans, makes a similar point, that all people on the face of the earth, every single individual that has ever lived, child, man, woman, whoever it is, is guilty before the eyes of God. Not a single person is innocent. And his whole point in the section as he's speaking to a group of Jews and Gentiles is to say, as you judge one another and divide yourselves among one another, you need to hear Jews and Gentiles alike that you all commit the same crimes. You all are guilty of the same offenses before God, and for this there is only one that can save you, 
There is only one way out for redemption, and it will not lie through you. It will lie through Jesus Christ. But make no mistake, for those that don't want to recognize it, what Paul says here will be true for them, but not just for them. As we'll look at the text, it is true for all people. Paul says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, that means rebellious, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, that is faithfulness, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. And just one more verse that I'm going to include to make Paul's point. You, therefore, have no excuse. You who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself. Because you who pass judgment do the same things. Paul's whole point is, don't let anyone arrogantly point the finger at another person or another group to think that they are the problem with the world before first pointing the finger at ourself to willingly admit and confess, Lord Jesus, if there is a problem with this world, if there is a problem with wickedness and sin, Lord Jesus, I am the chief. Because unless we are willing to admit that, we are not ready to hear the good news of the gospel of our Savior Jesus. And so often it's easy for Christians who hold to the truths of the scriptures, yes, for us who hold to all of the word of God as being straight from heaven, to hear this section and to latch on to those verses about homosexual relationships and think that Paul's point is that those sins are greater. Paul's point is not that those sins are greater. Paul's point is that all sins are as great as that, and that all people, no matter what sins they fall into, are guilty of offending the one who has loved them and created them and made them to glorify God and to love their fellow human beings. But instead of choosing that path, Instead of knowing what is written on our hearts and choosing to follow it, instead of repenting of our sins and trusting in Jesus, so many, he indicates, among the unbelieving Gentiles, decided to repress it and put it down. But this is a hard text then for all of us to apply to ourselves, I think, because the law naturally makes us uncomfortable. 
it's very easy for us to look at other people who might be guilty of what we think as the sins of others and pin them as the scapegoat for everything that is happening in the world around us. Or to simply do the very easy thing of picking the low-hanging fruit and the low-hanging sins and say, look, look at how terrible those sins are over there, how disgusting and degrading and filthy and awful. I am not like that. The rest of the world is like that. But that's a slippery slope. And that actually can lead to a weakening of the faith and an ultimate result in a person turning into a Pharisee of Pharisees. Somebody that thinks they are loved on God's account because of the things that they've offered to him. Instead of seeing all people as poor beggars, destitute and degraded by their own choices and own decisions. And if you stop and think to yourself that you have some good living in you apart from the Holy Spirit that God has placed in your heart, God has some words for you. Absolutely not. Let me read that list just a little bit quickly one more time if you think that you have nothing to repent of. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. Have you set your heart on other things to look for happiness apart from God? Have you put those above him? Full of envy. Isn't that the name of the game in society today? I see somebody wealthier than myself. I see somebody with more. And now I'm angry with my lot in life. And I decide that that's not fair. And they shouldn't have that. And I should have more. Envy. Murder. Remember, murder isn't just killing people. Murder is hating somebody, holding a grudge, being angry with somebody in your heart. Strife. Fights and relationships, deceit, lying, half-truths, and malice. They are gossips, speaking poorly about others behind their backs. Slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. I don't really need to keep going. When we read this text, it should rightly lead our hearts to tremble and be afraid and to say, Lord, who then can be saved? Where is their help? Where is their forgiveness? Because so often, Lord, I have been self-righteous. So often I have looked at the sins of others and thought that those are somehow more terrible than mine. But the truth is, Lord, that all sins before your sight stink to high heaven and you want nothing to do with them. And before your sinful heart steps in to say, well, that's not good for God. God isn't a God of wrath. We know Jesus isn't. No, he is. And here's why it's a good thing. Would you want a judge in a courtroom to turn a blind eye to a criminal? Would you want a judge in a courtroom to be soft on breaking the law? The answer is, no, you wouldn't. In fact, if a judge would turn a blind eye, if a judge would be bribed, if a judge would downplay what a criminal has done and not want to punish them for that, you'd say they're the most corrupt judge in the world. If God himself supported sin, that would make him the devil. The only way that God can remain God is to just hate all sin. And the other reason that God hates sin is this. We think of it as minor infractions. It's just something little that I do. But the honest truth is that every time I sin and every time you sin, do you know what we're doing with the truth? We're oppressing it. We're pushing it down in our hearts. Pushing it to the side and saying, yes, I know what is right. I know what I should do but I'm going to push that down and push it aside because what I want is more important than what God wants. It wasn't just unbelieving Gentiles who go against God by repressing the truth. It's every single one of us on a daily basis. And that's what ate Paul up in the book of Romans chapter 7 when he gets to that section we had it a few weeks ago where he says, the evil that I do not want to do because I have the Spirit living in me, the evil that I do not want to do I keep doing, and the good... The good that I don't want to avoid, that I keep uh, avoiding. We're told in the book of James that it's not just the evil things that we do that are sin. More often than not, for Christians, the sin that we commit is avoiding the good that we know should be done. Anybody who avoids the good that they ought to do, James says, sins. And he says that sin isn't a minor mistake. Sin isn't just a miscommunication. But he says that each individual is not tempted by God, but they are led astray when by their own sinful hearts they are enticed by sin, and when sin has conceived and given birth, it gives birth to death. All sin is destructive. All sin is disease and death from a spiritual standpoint. So would not the loving God, who is love from all eternity, 
also have to hate sin, which destroys and mars all that is good, all that is life? The answer is absolutely yes, he must. And this is why he pronounced a curse on the devil in the garden. Because the devil ultimately was the one that tempted Adam and Eve. And even though Adam and Eve had sinned, here's where grace comes in. God said that he would bring out his judgment on the devil chiefly. Adam and Eve would have consequences for their sin. They would experience the wrath of God and chastisements and discipline on a daily basis. But also that they would remember this world is broken. And the reason this world is broken is not because of Eve, my wife, as Adam wanted to do when he took an eight. And it's not because of the devil and God, as Eve wanted to do, and Adam over there, as she wanted to do. No, the reason the world is broken today is because of me and because of you. But here's the great love of our God that he does not want anyone to be lost to the fires of hell. He does not want to have to destroy anybody for themselves being participants in evil if they are a human being. Instead, he wants to take out all of his justice and anger on the devil. But here's the awesome, amazing love as well, that he chose to take all of the burden of that sin, all of the responsibility for your guilt and mine and take it squarely on his shoulders all the way to the cross. And the only way that he could make you and me right with God was through a sacrifice of blood, was to paint the cross red and to have the dust of Calvary be saturated with his blood, all for your purification and all for mine. So as he bled into the dust of Calvary, he was sanctifying your dust and mine, dust to dust, ashes to ashes. But for all who trust in Jesus as their Savior, they now have been taken from that death to life. And you have been given an infusion of his grace, not just an infusion, rather. You have been connected to all the righteousness that Jesus earned. For as much as we might suppress the truth of God on a daily basis, Jesus himself every day upheld the truth of God. And he was not just talking the talk. Jesus always walked the walk. He held out that truth to everybody while himself always abiding by it so that he could be that spotless Lamb of God. What are we told when we grow up and some of us have gone through uh, instruction and catechism classes? We're told this. Jesus Christ has redeemed me, a lost and condemned creature, purchased and won me from all sin, from death, and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death. All this he did that I should be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him with everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. Just as he has risen from the dead and lives and rules eternally, this is most certainly true. The only hope that we have every single day is to cling to the cross of Christ and hear those words that Jesus came for us. To look to the cross and see that sacrifice of atonement that took God and mankind and set them at peace so that now our hearts are refreshed and lifted, that no longer will God condemn me for my sin, but instead he chose to condemn his one and only son to give me everlasting life. What a great, incredible, merciful God we all have, and this is what he wants everyone to know, so let's never be self-righteous. But there is one other thing that we have to talk about in our text for today, because this is a hot-button issue. It's the sin that is called out in this passage, the sin of homosexuality. In connection to what I had just said, we need to understand as Christians that all Christians struggle with different types of sin. You could be a person sitting here right now today, and maybe you have temptations to be attracted to the same gender. But you struggle and you fight against that sin. You struggle and fight against it every day, and sometimes you fall into it, but after you do, you say, Lord Jesus, please forgive me for this. I know this is wrong, and I'm going to keep fighting, but more than that, I just need your grace to give me strength to keep on going. If that is you, then Christians can assure that individual, your identity is not found in your temptations. Your identity is not found in sometimes when you trip and stumble and fall into things that are wicked and wrong. Your identity is rooted in Jesus Christ. Paul himself even talks about this in the first book of Corinthians when he says, Some of you once were 
thieves and drunkards and homosexual offenders. That is what you once were, but now you have been washed and redeemed and sanctified by the blood of your Savior, Jesus. It is possible for people to struggle with those things, but to fight against them and then by God's grace to trust in his, in his love and mercy. They will be saved because they have faith in Jesus and they confess and repent of that sin. But there's something else that we also need to understand for today. That for those who don't repent of that sin, and for any sin for that matter, who latch on to something that is a voice, something that is forbidden in the scriptures, and they say, this thing I will not be sorry for. This thing I want you to accept. This thing I want you to tolerate. And celebrate it with me. Bring me in as you would anybody else and tell me that everything I'm doing is okay. God has very clear words in scripture about that. And he says, if you reject him, you will not be saved. This is not just about the sin of homosexuality. This is about the state of the heart. And this can be true for somebody that's guilty of a sexual sin, but they're straight as well. It could be somebody that's guilty of any other sin. The point is, are you willing to confess and repent of your sins and to look to Jesus as the only one who can save you? Or are you latching on to a sin and holding on to it and wanting no one else to tell you otherwise and wanting other people to join you in it? Here's the thing that we need to all understand as Christians living in the society in the Western world that we're living in. Tolerance is not a Christian virtue. Tolerance is not a Christian virtue. Nowhere on the pages of Scripture do you see God say to tolerate sin. In fact, in the book of Habakkuk, when the prophet is talking about God himself, he says in chapter 1, verse 13, this is God now, your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. And some want to say, yes, but Jesus is a different God from the God of the Old Testament. No, he's not. He is the same. In the Old Testament, we're told about the Lord, I, the Lord, do not change. And in the New Testament, we're told Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Jesus Christ does not tolerate sin because Jesus Christ is God himself. And we say, yes, but look at how patient and loving he is. Yes, but he always also called people to account. He was the friend of sinners, but he was not the friend that accepted them for their sin. He was not the friend of sinners who tolerated and said, what you are doing is good and okay because all people are sinful. That's fine. In the book of Revelation, we are told this. When Jesus himself, the resurrected Lord, who now is waiting to come back and save all of his people, he says this to one of the churches. To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate what that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols, that is, participating in idol worship. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling, so I will cast her on a bed of suffering and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Many churches today that have gotten rid of the idea of the scriptures that they teach that men should be pastors due to God's role of men and women, who now have women leading their churches, very often in those churches, those women take up the same role that Jezebel took up. And they tell God's people that don't know any better, they tell them, you can live in this way. Love is love is love. It doesn't matter if you're gay or straight. It doesn't matter if you're trans or not. You can still keep on in this way of life. And it's okay because God is this and God is that. This is not love. It is wolves in sheep's clothing 
leading God's people astray and damning people to hell who want to hold on to their sins. It is the exact opposite of love, and Jesus cannot tolerate it, nor can Christians tolerate it, because this does not come from God. Love is not love is not love, because God's love is the only kind of real love. And if your earthly love leads you to destroy somebody's soul spiritually and put them on the path to hell, that could be nothing else but hatred itself. We cannot just stand by and say, you know what, you do you and I do me and everybody can have their own lives. You raise your kids how you want and I'll raise my kids how you want and I'll never say anything because you can have your life and I can have mine and then we'll be at peace. God has not called us to peace with sin. He's called us to despise it. But how does this show in our lives? How do we both carry ourselves with love and also by holding to the law of God to call people to repentance? The answer is only rooted in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Because you look to him and you look to his ministry and you see him do everything that we so often fail at. You see him all for us. Never once tolerate sin. Not for a second. To every tax collector and prostitute and politician and soldier, every single person he ran to, whether Greek or, 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 or uh, Jew, whether child or adult, every single person he wanted to know the good news that he had rescued them from hell and given them everlasting life, but that they needed to repent and believe that good news. He did that for you and me. So if there have been times that you want to tolerate and accept it, look to Jesus and know that at the cross, he has completely forgiven that and taken it away. But also then, look to Jesus who so often with people that were guilty of terrible, terrible sins in the way that we think about it, dealt with them with patience and love. Love not that condones what they were doing wrong, but love that demonstrated itself in action and actually reached out to them to show them love in action and more than that, show them love in speech. How could Jesus have saved those people? It would have been having those hard conversations with them. If they had not heard the truth before, to sit them down and say, look, all of the things that you are choosing are leading you away from God. And yes, God loves you, but you are choosing death instead of life. Now look to me and know that I've come to save you from that. I am not judging you to condemn you. I am telling you these things so that you might have life and have it to the full. Think about people like the adulterous woman who is about to be stoned. Where Jesus said at the end, neither do I condemn you, but now go and leave your life of sin. Think about Mary, who came and anointed Jesus' feet with tears. Why? Because Jesus had shared with her the good news, both of law and of gospel, that he had forgiven her. And what did it lead her to do? Anoint his feet with her tears and dry them off with her hair. And Jesus said that what she did was beautiful and would be remembered for all ages. And on and on we can go. And how about this? How about the guy that was on the cross next to Jesus? The rebel, the thief, the criminal, probably a murderer. And when he prayed to Jesus after he saw his sin, remember me when you come into your kingdom, did Jesus turn to him and say, no, you've done too much wrong. No, you're too disgusting and filthy. Absolutely not. He looked at him and loved him and he said, I tell you the truth today. You will be with me in paradise. This is for you. I am the criminal. You are the criminal. Everyone out there is the criminal, but they are criminals that God loves with reckless abandon. And he came into this world to save them. But let us never think that God's love is a type that tolerates sin. Let us instead see that God's love leads him to take on the punishment himself as he came into this world and lived and died for us. But then also let's see the power of that life that he won in his resurrection that he has put in your hearts and he puts in the hearts of all who trust in him. And yes, even if there is someone in your life who is willing to listen but they live against what God says, take that opportunity, their willingness to listen and discuss and put the word of God in their heart. Because crazier things have happened than that a gay person or a trans person or any other kind of person could be brought into the kingdom of God. There's all types. And then, if they trust that good news, you can share the awesome message. God has washed them clean and he sees none of it. You can share the same message with them that you've had shared with yourself. 
That now that you are found in Jesus, that you are baptized and clothed with his righteousness, you are washed, you are redeemed, you are sanctified by your Lord Jesus Christ. You are no longer children of darkness, but children of light. What is it that the world needs right now? The world needs right now repentance. Repentance that sees all of our sin and that freely confesses, I am no better than anybody else but also a repentance, a true repentance that looks to Jesus Christ alone, the Son of God who came into this world and lived for you and died for you and rose for all of us so that we might be his own. Amen.